Well, good morning and welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you for being here with us today. Also, thank you for joining us online. For those of you in our online community, we're so thankful that you are a part of what we're doing here today. To say that John Newton was a wicked man would be the understatement of the year. He was a sailor, but he was a slave trader. In fact, he was so vile and so vulgar, you've heard the phrase, he cusses like a sailor. Well, he was so vile and vulgar that his captain, who was a sailor, obviously, would literally punish him for being so vile and so vulgar. He wrote incredibly dirty poems and songs, and he was just a disgusting individual. And one day, while he was at sea, a storm came. We all have storms, right? He had a storm that descended on their ship, and it was incredible. In fact, everyone, including John Newton, thought they were going to lose their lives. And in that moment, John Newton called out to God. He repented. He said, God, if you'll spare my life, I want you to save me, not just physically, but I give my life to you. And it was said that there was such incredible change. This man lived in the 1700s. There was such incredible change in his life that he went from being a slave trader to being an abolitionist. He he went from being a sailor to being someone that studied Christian theology at university and eventually became an ordained minister in the Church of England. And he went from writing vulgar and vile poems and songs to writing Christian songs. How can something like that happen? Well, only because of Jesus, we know that. But he wrote poems and songs and there's one song in particular that you've heard In fact, it's said that this song, which was written in 1773, is sung over 10 million times a year in church in the United States alone. And you know it as amazing grace. God's amazing grace. So I want you to join me singing this song. Travis is going to play for us. And I'm going to attempt to lead it. If it sounds terrible, just plug your ears and uh, you sing out and drown me out. Ready? Let's sing it together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Let's do it together. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved? How precious did that
amazing grace. I want you to notice the little phrase at the end of the first verse. It said, I was blind, but now I see. If anything describes the state of a person before Christ, I was blind, and then after Christ, I see. That I don't know of a better description, and I don't know of anything that you could describe God's grace as other than amazing. It is absolutely and utterly amazing. Well, today I want to talk to you on this thought, Jesus came to help us see. We're in this series called 50 Days of Hope, and we're going from the resurrection of Jesus And then for 10 days after his resurrection back to heaven, the disciples waited in Jerusalem and then the Holy Spirit came and the church started. And so it is during those 50 days that we're focusing our study. And last week I talked about that Jesus came to give us hope. And so today we want to talk about how that Jesus came to help us see. The fact is when you have an encounter with Jesus... You see things differently after that. Things don't look the same. They don't seem the same because they're not the same. And I want to read a passage from Luke chapter 24. This was just a couple of days after the resurrection of Jesus. And he's walking with some disciples. In fact, they were walking and he joined them. Let's begin reading in Luke chapter 24. And we'll read verses 13 to 15 and then verses 28 to 31. It says, the same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. Once again, the, resu- the uh, crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. And I want you to pay close attention to this next sentence. But God kept them from recognizing him. God kept them from recognizing him. Then skipping down to verse 28, it says, By the time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him, Stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it, and he gave it to them. And suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and at that moment, he disappeared. I want to give you three thoughts from this passage of Scripture of how Jesus came to help us see. He came to help us see things differently than what we normally see things. He came to change our perspective. He came to change our worldview Here's the first thought I want to give you today. An encounter with Jesus changes how you see God. It changes how you see God. You see, we have a tendency to see God through whatever worldview that we were raised with. But notice those two sentences that I uh, drew your attention to earlier. But God kept them from recognizing him. And then uh, down toward the end, suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. So they did not recognize him. And then all of a sudden, they did. Now, I'm going to give you something that if you'll promise to stay awake for the next 60 seconds, it will help you, okay? This, you may have know this, that the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and Greek scholars would tell us that these two sentences are called divine passives, divine passives. And I know you say, so what, who cares, big deal, What in the world does that mean? Well, here's why that is important. Um, It means that they did not change how they saw Jesus, but God did. A divine passive means that you're not the one doing it, but God is. And so when it says they saw Jesus, but they didn't recognize him at first, and then later their eyes were opened, that is what God did for them. What does that tell us about the Christian life? It tells us this, that when you have an encounter with Jesus, it changes the way that you see God. When you and I 
or able to change the way that we see things, or rather God changes the way we see things, it changes everything. Now, our worldview is normally seen through the lens of our background. Our parents affect our worldview. Our background, our environment that we grew up in, that affects our worldview. Your education, your friends will affect your worldview. And and I'll say this, and this is particularly important. These two disciples, their view of God was being seen through the lens of pain and loss. They had experienced the pain of seeing Jesus put to death. And they had experienced that loss, and they were confused because it had been reported that he had raised from the dead, and they did not know what was going on. And I'll say this, for each of us, the fact is that our pain and loss will affect the way we see God. And it is not until we have an encounter with the risen Christ, it is not until we have an encounter with God himself himself, that we will be able to change the way that we see God. Now, I've said this many times, the way you see God, how you see him is the most important thing about you. Because when you see him as the one that inflicts pain, you're going through your pain, you're going through your sorrow, you're going through your loss, and if we're not careful, we will get angry at God or we'll see God through that lens as if somehow or another he doesn't care. As if somehow or another the very God of the universe who sent his only son to die in our place and proved his love for us on the cross, as if somehow or another he doesn't care. Well, the Bible is very clear that Jesus experienced and knew every bit of pain and loss that we could ever go through on the cross. He experienced rejection. You cannot have any rejection in your life whether it be from an ex-spouse, whether it be from someone that used to be a friend of yours that stabbed you in the back, you can never experience pain and loss like Jesus did, and he knows what you're going through. You may have lost a job, you may have lost your health, and he knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your pain. He knows everything about you, and he suffered it alongside of you, and the Bible is very clear that he knows what we're going through. You ever notice that whenever you have something terrible in your life, some kind of pain or some kind of loss, that one of the most important things in your life, in your experience, is to have someone that knows what you're going through. And even sometimes just having someone there that maybe they don't know what we're going through, but the fact that they're there, Jesus not only knows what you're going through, he promised that he would never leave you or forsake you. Now, what changes our view of God? Well, I talked about this last week. I'll talk about it again next week. It's the word repentance. Now, I was raised thinking that the word repentance means that you need to change your behavior. I've heard it illustrated many times. If you're walking this way towards sin, you're walking this way toward destruction, you're walking this way in the way you ought not to go, you change your direction. You turn from doing that And that is what repentance is. And that could not be further from the gospel. The fact is, repentance does not mean change your behavior. Because your being right with God does not depend on your ability. It doesn't depend on your ability to get better or to turn over a new leaf or to be more moral. Jesus did not come to make you moral. He came to bring dead things to life. And so for you and me, what we need to understand is that repentance does not mean to change your behavior. Only God can do that. Repentance means to change your thinking about God. It means to change the way that you think about him and toward him. It means to agree with him. And God tells us that it is through Jesus and Jesus alone that our behavior can change and our world can change. And the way you see God is the most important thing about you. Jesus came to help us see God differently. And an encounter with the risen Christ will change how you see God. How do you see God? Do you see him as abandoning you? Of hurting you? 
Not that he would intentionally hurt you, but that he just doesn't care, that he doesn't know what you're going through, that he doesn't know your pain or your suffering. Oh, I hope you'll be able to see that that is not who God is at all. He sees all. He knows all. He can see further than we can. He knows more than we do. And we have to learn to trust him. An encounter with Jesus will change how you see God. Here's the second thing. An encounter with Jesus will change how you see yourself. This is a big one. The fact is, we often will see ourselves differently than we should. For some, they see themselves as just irreparably broken. That because of their failure in the past, because of what they've done in their past, that there is no hope for them. Yeah, there might be hope for somebody else. And they say things like, boy, if I were to walk into that church, the roof would collapse. You know it would. And then there are those that think that they're all that. They think that, they think of the audacity of this, that they could go to a holy God, the standard of perfection, and say to him, hey, I am good enough. I'm good enough to go to heaven. I'm good enough to be in your presence. I'm good enough. And we kind of treat God as the ATM machine. We put in some good works, and he spits out some blessings. But an encounter with the risen Christ will change how you see yourself. I want you to notice this verse. It says, as they sat down to eat, he, Jesus, I want you to notice what he did. He took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And when Jesus did that, suddenly their eyes were opened. He took it, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it. He took it, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it. He took it, and he blessed it. And he broke it, and he gave it. Do you know that God will do that very same thing to you if you'll let him? Thank God he takes us just like we are. Thank God that we don't have to turn over a new leaf. Thank God we don't have to have a certain amount of money in the bank. Thank God we don't have to have a certain amount of morality in our life. Thank God it's not dependent upon our family. Thank God it's not dependent on whether or not our grandmother brought, bought a pew down at the Methodist church and has a little black brass plaque on the end of the, the pew to show it. That is not what is necessary for you and me to be made right with God. He will take you just like you are. He will take you sin and warts and all. And it's a good thing, otherwise he would not take us at all because he knows us better than anyone else and yet he loves us more than anyone else. Does that ever blow your mind? God knows everything about me. He knows everything I've ever done wrong. He knows every wrong motive I've ever had. He knows every wrong thought I've ever had. He knows every wrong thing I've ever done. He knows every sin I've ever committed. He knows how I've wanted to treat people. And sometimes we put the big smile on our face and we smile, but in our heart, we're like, if you just let me, you'll turn your back. I'll stab you. I will stab you. I'll cut you. You know, I grew up in the country of North Carolina, so that's kind of the way we talk, you know. And, and there's nothing more disingenuous than a southerner that says well bless your heart because <laughs> what you if you're from the north you don't realize that they're cussing you out all right they are cussing you out they're saying if you'll just turn your back i'm going to hurt you bless your heart but you know what god does he takes us he takes us just like we are and then you know what he does he blesses us have you ever considered the blessing of being saved? Have you ever considered the blessing of God taking you just like you are? Have you ever considered the blessing of life? Have you ever considered how much God truly does bless us? He forgives us. He, he puts us in his family. He gives us talent. He wants to use us. He takes care of us. In every way, he blesses us. He takes us and he blesses us. But then he'll break us. Now, I don't want you to think of breaking as in he will harm you, not like he's going to break your leg, 
but rather he will break away the things in your life that don't belong there. When he takes us and blesses us and then breaks us, you know what he's doing? He's getting rid of the things that don't belong in our life. That's all he's doing. He he breaks away the sin in our life. He breaks away the bad habits in our life. And he will deliver you if you let him. He, He breaks away the hurts. I've seen people that have been so incredibly hurt in their past. Not just abandonment. Not just heartbreak. But even worse, abuse someone harming you, someone hurting you on purpose. These things in our life, they build up, and they build up in our mind. And for some of you, you grew up your whole life being told that you're not enough, that you're not good enough, that you're stupid, that you're ugly, that you're worthless, that there's no hope for you. What's wrong with you, they'll say. But don't you know what God does? When we... Have an encounter with the risen Christ. He will take you, past and all. He'll bless you. But then in those moments of trial in our life, in those moments when life gets in the way, when those moments when our past crops back up to us, he will break it away. Sometimes it might be slowly. Sometimes it could be quickly. But what he does is he takes you And he blesses you. And he breaks away those hurts and those hang-ups and those sins and those things from your past. He takes you and he blesses you and he breaks you. And then, thank God, he gives you. In other words, he uses you. And what so many people fail to realize is that they need to see themselves differently than they do. Because I want you to know something. In your own strength... You're probably not enough. Now, there are some that are more talented than others and some that have had a better background than others. But in your own strength, you're probably not enough. Those lies from the enemy that he whispers into your ear, they could be true. But when you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, he says, you are enough because you are my child. You are enough because You have been given the power to become the sons and the daughters of God. You are enough because I have made you more than a conqueror. You are enough because I have declared that you are blessed. You are enough because I have forgiven you. And we start to see ourselves differently. Let me ask you a question. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as broken? Do you see yourself as ruined? Do you see yourself as hopeless? Do you see yourself as, well, I've just I've failed so many times and I know I'm gonna do it again, and you've just given up hope? Well, I want you to know that an encounter with the risen Christ will not only change how you see God, but it'll change how you see yourself. And then finally, an encounter with Jesus changes how you see others. You see, when I look at God differently, when I see him for who he is, how incredible he is, how loving he is, how holy he is, and I realize that I can look at myself differently because he has forgiven me, he has saved me, he has blessed me, he takes me and he uh, blesses me and he breaks me, he breaks away those things in my life and in my past that don't belong, and then he uses me, he uses me in spite of myself, in spite of my past. Well, then I'll begin to see others differently. Have you ever noticed that in this culture, we sure do see others in the wrong way? I can remember a time, even in politics, and I say even in politics, that you could be on different sides of the aisle and you could still be friends. We live in a culture now that if you don't believe every bit of nonsense that comes out of either side, then you're counted as an enemy. They want to cancel you. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard of in my life. The truth of the matter is, you'll begin to see others differently. An encounter with Jesus will do that. Uh, You'll see race differently. Listen to what Acts chapter 17 verse 26 says. And he, talking about God, made from one 
man. One man. Every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Who are we from? We're from one man. <laughs> We're from one man, one woman. Adam and Eve, that's it. Did you know that race is a human construct? It's not a biblical thing. That the amount of melanin that you have in your skin does not change who you are at the core of your person. Now, I do realize that there's racism in the world. You'd have to be an idiot to not see that. But the truth of the matter is, I personally believe that the answer lies in biblical justice, not social justice. It lies in the gospel not in any kind of critical theory. You want to know the right theory? It comes from the Word of God. It comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, when you and I have an encounter with Jesus, it changes how we see others. I love that we started this church, and when we did, we prayed that God would help us to look like our community, that he would help us to look like heaven, that we would be racially diverse. Why? Because that's the way God wants it. That's the way heaven is going to be like. If you don't like racial diversity, then you don't want to go to heaven. You really don't. Because God says that he doesn't include race in this, but he says from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. And what he's describing is different cultures. God sees us all as brothers and sisters in Christ. So when God changes me, when I have an encounter with the risen Christ, it changes the way I see race. Another thing it'll change, it'll change how I see gender. Well, don't we live in a time when things are confusing? Listen to what Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now, I've got another verse I'm going to read in a moment, but I want to just point out to you that when it comes to gender, and I'm choosing my words very carefully because I can uh, be misunderstood, there are people today that really struggle with uh, what is called gender identity dysphoria, and it has become a political statement. In fact, I read this past week, just thinking and preparing on this message, a medical doctor was asked this question, and he refused to answer it because of political pressure and political correctness. He was asked this question. They said, doctor, can a man, a person that was born as a man, can a man have a cervix and a uterus? And he would not answer the question. And, and what that tells me is that the enemy has gained a great foothold to confuse many people and hurt many people. Now, according to Scripture, and according to science, by the way, uh, God created us male and female. There are, there are gender roles, but we're equal in God's sight, okay? And so when I see someone, it doesn't mean that I ignore the obvious. I know if you're a woman or a man, we can look at you and tell, okay? Uh, you have different reproductive organs. You have uh, different... Uh, genes or chromosomes, we, we are different, okay? But we're the same in Christ. Now, let me say this. How do we treat those that struggle with this? There are many in our world today uh, that are, would describe themselves as transgender. How do we deal with that? What do we do? What do we do as a church? Well, the Bible is very clear that men and women are created in the image of God and you are a man or a woman, but the Bible is also very clear that in Christ we are to love people. And we are to receive people with open arms. It doesn't mean we ignore problems or we don't help them. It just simply means that uh, in Christ our job is not to stand up on a bully pulpit somewhere and yell at people. But our job is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. An encounter with Jesus will change how you see gender. Listen to what it says in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. You know, the interesting thing is he, he deals with race. He deals with economics. 
And he deals with gender in that one statement, in that one verse. God sent Jesus so that we would see things differently. We'll see race differently. We'll see gender differently. And we'll see the outward appearance differently. Listen to what John 7, 24 says. Stop judging by mere appearances. Now, look, I realize that it's hard not to judge by mere appearances. And that does not mean that you shouldn't take a bath or comb your hair, okay? If you're not born beautiful, uh, work at it, okay? That's what I'm saying. Uh, you know, put on some makeup. Do something, okay? Uh, but the fact is, if you're born beautiful, um, we're not to judge by outward appearances, and, and that's hard to do sometimes because we often we see a person that's attractive looking and we'll like kind of act differently around them. You know, the Bible is very clear. We're not to judge by outward appearances. God is the one that looks at the heart, okay? And so what we are to do is we are to see race differently. We're to see gender differently in Christ. We're to see the outward appearance differently. And then uh, uh, notice what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. It says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. You know what that means? That I don't look at these outward things. When I see a person, I see a person that God loves. I see a person that is made in the image of God. I see a person that Jesus Christ died for. That's what I see. And then, I'm going to throw this one out. You probably haven't thought of this. We're to see age differently. I know that in our culture that there are people that sometimes even lose their jobs because of their age. What a sad thing. The fact is, in many cultures, uh, the older you get, the more you are revered. The older I get, the more I want to live in one of those places, right? But I want you to listen to what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It says, never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as you would to your own father. Talk to younger men as you would to your own brothers. Treat older women as you would your mother, and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. Now, let, let me just show you. Older people, you're not to look down on others that are young. Not to do it. How are you to treat them? It didn't say as a son or a daughter. It says as a brother or a sister. And when you see someone older, how are we to treat them? With respect. So I am to see race differently. I'm to see gender differently. I'm to see the outward appearance differently. I'm to see age differently. And finally, and this is the last thought, I'm to see wealth differently. If there's anything that will trip us up, it's this. We some, see somebody with money, and we're like, ooh, we got to act differently around this person. Now, listen to what the Bible says about that. 1 Timothy 6, 17, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to put their trust in money. And you could conversely say that we're not to treat them any differently because of their money. We're not to give respect or treat people with respect. Doesn't mean you're not to be respectful, but in other words, with respect to their money, okay? Because the poor person is just as valuable in the eyes of God as the rich person. Just as valuable. And I learned a long time ago that if as a church, if we will accept and receive the people that nobody wants, then God will give us the people that everybody wants. And that's what God wants us to see. He says, don't put your trust in money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. He gives us all we need. And by the way, that doesn't mean that you don't take a nice vacation if you can afford it. But you know what he's saying? You don't have to take a trip to Hawaii to have enjoyment in life. Now, if you want to send me, I'll be more than happy to go and minister to the people on the beaches in Maui, all right? I know those people need Jesus, and so as a church, I think that would be a great missions project. But you know what? No, all kidding aside, the fact is he gives you everything you need to enjoy life. You just got to see it. You know that some of the wealthiest people that I know are some of the most miserable people that I know. You say, why is that? We always hear that, you know, 
money can't buy happiness, and that's true. But I think part of it is that when you have everything that you want, you literally have no hope. You have, you have no, nothing that you're hoping for. And when you begin to live without hope, then you begin to become hopeless. And I'm not suggesting that if you have money uh, that you're not right with God or that God doesn't love you. I'm not suggesting that even remotely. I'm simply saying just do what the Bible says. Don't trust in that money to bring you happiness. Don't trust in that money to bring you joy because it can't. It might pay for a nice vacation. But it's not going to bring you joy and happiness. And so an encounter with Jesus changes how I see God. It changes how I see myself. And it changes how I see others. And I don't know about you, but that's my prayer for our church. Is that we will see God the way he was meant to be seen. That we'll see ourselves differently through the blood of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. And we'll begin to see others way God wants us to see them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to see you differently, to see ourselves differently, to see others differently. Lord, I thank you that Jesus, an encounter with him will change the way we look at life. And Father, thank you for that. I pray that you bless our people now. Before we finish our prayer, let me ask you this question. What is God saying to you today? Is God speaking to you about looking at yourself differently or him differently or others? Is God speaking to you about being a member of this church, getting involved? Well, what I would ask is that you respond to whatever he's speaking to you about. But then finally, what I would say is, is God speaking to you about salvation? Do you need to trust him as your savior? We like to give people an opportunity every Sunday, online and in person. I wonder if there would be anyone that would say, Pastor, today, I need to trust Jesus as my Savior. I'm not sure if I'm right with God. I'm not sure if I'm on my way to heaven or not, but I'd like to be. I wonder if there'd be anybody that would raise their hand and say, with nobody looking, just me, I need that today, Pastor. I need to be saved. I need Christ in my life. If you're joining us online, and I see your hand, thank you. If you're joining us online, uh, as well as in the room, you can say something like this to God. Dear Lord, I ask you to save me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And I receive you by faith right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Before we finish our prayer, before we raise our head, I wonder if there'd be anybody in the room that would say, Pastor, I prayed that along with you today to receive Jesus. Would you raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it? Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hands. God bless you. God bless you. Others, thank you. I see your hand. Four or five people in the room. There are many, no doubt, online as well. If you're online, click at the bottom of the screen that you prayed to receive Christ today. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Father, thank you for those that got saved today. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst today. Thank you for what you're doing in our church. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to help us see. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.